Katic on Eurosport. He was the man that ran up winner ahead of Furlan uh, with, in third place, uh, Berzin. Berzin not riding today and looking back down there, familiar jersey of Lance Armstrong, powerful as ever in the race, taking second place in today's Baston Liège just seven days ago. So many of the riders you've been used to watching at Eurosport are here at the front yet again. We've already had an early breakaway group of uh, uh, Chiesa, uh, Capella, and Fernando Pinero from Festina. And those three went ahead, the usual sort of suicidal break that sets off, and gained a maximum of some five minutes on the, uh, on the field. It's a very, very tricky course indeed, though, and as soon as the uh, riders get out there, out of sight, out of mind, still the rest of the field here, waiting, I think, until those final climbs, which will really, when the hammer goes down, usually it's round about the um, Hallam Bay, with 20 kilometres to go. But the race explodes, that's where the action took place last year, when the four-man winning break went away. 250 kilometres in all the riders are taking in on this that is St George's Day in uh, in England and if I look at the English performances in this Amstel Gold over the years Joe McLaughlin finished a fine fourth in 1986 and we're glad to see Joey back into team management at the moment in the UK, back in the sport that he's liked so much. And uh, when Joey was fourth, I remember that the, many of the foreign journalists would scratch their head and say, who is this Joey McLaughlin? Well, they soon found out uh, what a great man he was, went on to win such great things as the, as, the, as the milk race. And Joey fourth in 86. And this on St George's Day, let's look at the other Englishman, Malcolm Elliott, third in 1987. Well, there... Uh, there's just one Englishman in the race this year, uh, Sean Yates, who perhaps won't like the, the climbs very much to his liking. Very strong man indeed, but they're short, sharp and hard. And Sean coming back into this race after a superb Paris Bay, had a bit of a rest and now he's uh, in this main field uh, riding and looking forward to, I presume, going over to the Tour du Pont, which is the one that very much is in the eyes of uh, Lance Armstrong to ride. But nevertheless, the Italians here strong on the front and looking back then uh, let's talk about the great britain riders as much as the english because robert miller's riding today and we welcome also brian smith now a name like brian smith you'd think he was a solid english but he's in fact a scotsman so we ought to call him brian max smith i suppose riding for motorola uh, on the first of classics and we hope we might have a chance to see him later on and as ever the bold and redoubtable sean kelly is riding today third in 1980 fourth in 1982 so the Irish still in here two Scotsmen one uh, from Great Britain but as ever the Italians on the front are looking to the far side there you can see Tunisia here with the flowing locks from Holland looking to try and do something well there Lance Armstrong on the right hand side with the rainbow jersey of the uh, world champion round his shoulder and right alongside him then we have well, as the cameras now move the other white jersey you saw was that of the World Cup leader Arnold Chamille who is doing an extremely good and competent performance in the World Cup this year. And uh, let's have a look at his, his points overall to put you in the picture about uh, what he's got to do to defend that championship before he goes into the recess for the, the tours yet to come. Coming into this race after the Liège battle on Liège, Andre Chamil with 91 points. Let's look back down. See the chap with the red shorts and the white top. That's Andre Chamil from uh, the Russian who is now registered in Moldavia. And uh, he has 91 points, out of Chamil, ahead of Giorgio Furlan, 75 points from uh, Gavis Balan, Fabio Baldato, 67 points in third spot. Those are the leading contenders for the World Cup crown. As yet again, this uh, marvellous Gavis Balan machine on the front, Marino Argentan driving this one along, just alongside him there. Number 76, uh, Alberto Volpi, winner of the Leeds round of the World Cup last year. And come on, come on, come on, go, go, go. <laughs> he wants us out of the way uh, with this very, very fast-moving bunch at the moment. Actually, the commissaires are not usually overly concerned about the, uh, the television camera, provided he doesn't tow the ride along. He's on the left-hand side of that road, just up ahead the echelon. That's our, our TV camera picking up the action of this very, very fast-moving bunch indeed. And one of the commissaires just saying he was blocking the view and blocking the way in which the commissaire was coming through. One of the commissaires today, uh, Wim Rosenborg, well-known to 
British supporters of cycling. He's been over several times, things like the Kellogg's and the Milk Crazy, one the Chief Commerce says. Another chap on one of the motorbikes, you won't be able to see him, is Henk uh, Brunkness. He uh, comes across to things like the Kellogg's and rides motorbikes there uh, in, in our race as well. So we've got a lot of connections with the Dutch over the years, and some of the officials here, well known to British followers of the sport. But yet again, the Italians, as ever, driving hard. The front, this one by the Bjorn Reese, not Italian, but rides for the Italian team. And we've not seen a lot of Bjorn Reese this year. He came over from the Alios Tier team to join the Gris Balan. I think they're, they're keeping him more in uh, reserve for the tours, but he's doing his stint at the front now. Look at the speed of this bunch. They've been absolutely strung out by the pressure of Gris Balan at the front and to pull back that, uh, that leading group. And that is some race. You can see how quick they're going because all the way down the line, everybody's having to pedal. Very often you can coast along if you're sat in the group. When they're one by one by one by one by one like this, they've got a freewheel around this corner, and then you'll find that they, they've got to put the speed up again uh, as they, they close the gaps down. And there they go. It's a little tricky course, I suppose many of you are saying, well, Holland's flat, if you've not watched the Amstel goal before, so what are they doing holding a bike race where windmills proliferate? Well, we're down in the southeast corner of Holland, and they always call it little Switzerland, I suppose, because lots of conky bits to go up and down, particularly through Valkenburg, where the World Championship was held a few years ago when Jan Raas uh, won the World Championships and Didi Turo, Turo fell off in, in no uncertain terms. And we're in that neck of the woods at the moment, excuse the expression, we're going through the trees. It's very hilly, and just to make matters even more entertaining, we nip over the border into Belgium a couple of times, and particularly on the final run back in towards uh, Maastricht, uh, then that is where they will come in on some of the undulating Belgian roads. The race being held then from uh, various start points over the years has been changed, but now since 1971 we've had the Heerlen uh, Messen uh, and then in, into the edge of Maastricht as, as a finishing uh, route, and it's been pretty well the same for recent years, but it had before that had very many starts and finishes before it settled down to the course we know today. Well, this is some cracking speed they're going at. And let's have a little look who we've got here. A nice mixed bag going through at the moment. They must be travelling at somewhere in excess of 35 miles an hour. This uh, slightly downhill bit, uh, helicopter camera over the top for Moto 1, Moto 2 behind, they're all split all over the place at the moment. Tremendous, tremendously fast start to the race. What a direct contrast, this particular part of Holland to the, uh, the flatlands, better known for the dikes and the polders, the windmills, and of course cyclists riding on single gear bikes, no need for multi-gears when you get up into the proper part of Holland, and they all ride along on these enormous bikes, with enormous wheels, and it's interesting the way in which the Dutch are more and more uh, beginning to make the city centres for bicycles, pedestrians and public transport only, putting traffic calming and uh, putting in chicanes to stop the traffic going through quickly and allowing people to get back there and ride bikes and a massive, massive number of uh, cyclists in Holland. Probably per capita has more bikes, I suppose, than any other nation in Europe. They sell something in excess of a million bikes a year, if memory serves me correct, uh, amongst about 11 million population. So that's new bikes every year. So imagine all the old ones. If we went over to Holland on holiday, we see all these old wrecks marooned against lampposts slowly disintegrating as people take off the saddles and then take off the front wheels and pedals and bits and pieces. And in the end, you just get a, a frame that's left marooned and locked to a lamppost. And eventually, they come and cut those away as well. And every so often, the civic authorities have a sweep of the streets to get rid of the old bikes which have been abandoned or stolen and then left. And the owners uh, just have lost sight and they go out and buy yet another new one.
Well, these are the racing men. There we are. 82 Ks up on your screen. And uh, Mechelen, yep, we're just going to that. They will, in fact, at this particular point now, have covered 168 kilometres, running a little bit behind schedule. We're due to pass through here to about uh, uh, half past two, but we're now coming up. This is Central European time, live coverage at uh, Central European time, coming up towards about uh, 10 to three. So they're just running a little bit behind schedule at the moment at uh, Mechelen on the course and I'll just have a quick look at what there is ahead of them in terms of the the next big climb. Well the climb 17th climb on the list will be the one which will spread this little lot out and that's at uh, Epperheide. In fact now we've come through Epperheide and it's the next one after Epperheide that we're going to take in now. So uh, our early leaders having set a hot pace. Now this Gavis Balan team. Oh, always a problem. And this is going to be a disappointment for Saligari, who's one of the strong men from the uh, GBMG team. And the speed at which that bunch is going, this will only take something like about 10 to 15 seconds maximum. He's back on his bike. Very quick uh, wheel change there. But he's, you see, it, it's in the in the very high gear out of the right side. These were the, the four riders at the back that got blasted out that very fast moving group. So he's at least got some company now. But the question is, can the four of them that were off the back of that group uh, regain the field? He's steamrolling past, having a quick look over their shoulders. This is our little group that got blasted out by the leaders after that early breakaway had been set up by uh, Chiesa, Capella and Fernando Pinero. And now Saligari is going to have to try and tow them up, back up to the uh, the group, Christian Hen for Telecoms, quickly onto his wheel at the back, and you can see the helicopter right down the road, that's where the main field is. And they've gone, they can't hold them, so Saligari has rocketed off down the road, and uh, so Piccoli for Mercantone Uno now, sitting at the back, hadn't got the strength to close down, so can Saligari get back? At least he's got company to help him, Christian Hen, the two trying to get back to the leaders. Scribble riders seem to have lost interest in the leader at the moment, Ken Galter, who's just pedding away from them and just sitting here looking quite comfortable. Um, this fellow then, usually working as a domestic. And there he goes. He's quite a good pro, starting way back in uh, 1986 uh, as a professional. And early on in 88, riding for Alios Tier, won the uh, Schaubenbrau Cup in, in Stuttgart and took a second place of the, of the Tour of Venetia. And here we got Johan Museo. Now then, what's going on? Tunisia moving through the front, Armstrong just behind him. GBMG beginning to put the locks on the front. Looks like uh, Kipuchi going up to them as well. Just 13 riders, unlucky for some, in this little chasing group here. The yellow jersey you can see in there, that, that's Rooks and uh, Tunisa, the TVM. That's Tunisa just coming off the front. Armstrong leading the chase. It puts you back in, in third spot, but the GBMG rider sat in between. Let's see what happens now. So he doesn't come through. Look, Armstrong looks back. The GBMG rider sat there doing nothing. He's not going to come through at all. Nice bit of marking as far as he's concerned, uh, leaving Kiyapuchi to come through, but Armstrong says, well, I'll turn a bit further, but he's having to do a lot of work, and Kiyapuchi can't help me. He's splattered all over the place. In the land, the windmills, they've all got big gears windmilling around now. And having difficulty coming up there, that's Kiyapuchi, as I said, they're going across then. Camille onto his wheel. What a rip-snorting race this one is. Everybody going flat out. Neil. Oh, not surprised he's come across to come and join then. Giorgio Furlan for Gavis Balan. 
and ever present well he knows his way around this particular course then coming across uh, Gianni Bugno for Palsy last year pipped into second spot and must be looking for a chance to win today and he's just staying there or thereabouts we haven't seen him doing much work on the front but Bugno second last year twice world champion already uh, victor this year in the Tour of Flanders by Nats Whisker from uh, Jörn Mazzeo is in that little group so we've got a proper sort out going on here Janisa bringing up that little chasing group. Brooks is in there as well. Every man for himself. Four men here, five men there. The chase really is on. We've seen some rip-roaring bike racing on Eurosport this year. And uh, I say it probably every year, but this to me has been a cracking start to the season. There's been no holes barred, different winners all the time. Uh, the Italians have certainly been controlling the racing, but nevertheless, they haven't had it all their own way with uh, Berzin, uh, or admittedly rides from the uh, Italian team, winning and Chamil winning as well. Just some 75 k's to go then. 175 covered. Well, this is the fellow that's decided to have a little go on the front and cause the trouble. And on his own, you can see the damage that's being caused behind, how much they were being being spread out as Kengialda went away from them. And he's actually split the field quite convincingly. So for one man to do that and cause that amount of consternation, he, he made it look pretty easy the way he drifted off the front. I think they allowed too much of a gap to open up uh, when they were just sort of pottering along. And now they've had to start putting some real pressure on to get up to him. And there we are, there's a regroupment going. I thought those first Two little groups, five and seven or so, would uh, get themselves back together. In the last count I had it was 13, or lucky for some, but let's see what they're at now. They're <laughs> looking over the shoulder and saying, in the sort out, what's left of this little lot? And that's the big chasing group. Looks like Charlie Motte leading the charge to pull them all back together. And so even, even more have come up from behind to join in the work that's being done on the front. Brooks looks back to see. <laughs> see the car they've closed the whole of this dual carriageway down and lost the official vehicle because they've charged down the other side just to cause concern to all and sundry. But there we are, Ron and Pansek are having quite a good year indeed. It was way back, what, about 1990, I think it was, when he and uh, Steve Barr and Claudio Chiapucci all managed to take the yellow jersey after being part of a four-man breakaway group that um, surprised everybody on day two. Uh, now that David Cassani is, I would say, likely winner of this race, but he's gone back almost to Messi because they, they really are uh, looking after Joan Mazzeo, although Cassani, for my money, had a fair chance of winning, but he's gone back to be the domestic. He's collecting all those bottles, shoving them inside his, his, his back pockets, He'll stick him down in his jersey. They'll even put him over the, the back shoulders and wedge him across their, their, uh, uh, the, you know, the underneath the top of their, their jersey and between their shoulder blades. Uh, Capucci's arm going up, also looking for a drink as well. And Alida taking good advantage of that lull in hostilities behind him because there's. Uh, no determined effort the motor chase him down so he can stay there a bit longer out in front. And uh, can get out to here. Looking very good indeed. And the regrouping going on behind. So that has been a really cracking start to the race. And Konishev trying to put the pressure on as well. And this man took a silver medal. I said how the East riders have come on the scene now. And we have just in the lead, one rider at the moment, uh, Ken Gialta. Uh, somehow Museo seemed to try and go off the front. I haven't seen where he's got to yet a while. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Konishev here coming on to this little uh, climb here. Uh, 66 uh, kilometers yet to go. 
And uh, this then, the Amsterdam goal, and the crowd urging them on to, to great effect. And I have with me my co-commentator now. We've given a plug to the, the English, the Irish, and the Scots taking part. I'm happy to have Stephen Roche with me yet again. Stephen, a race which I think your best place was fourth in, wasn't it, at one time? Actually, um, my best place was actually second. Oh, you're right. Yes, I found it somewhere here. Keep yeah. talking. <laughs> my second place in the 1982 behind Jan Ross. And uh, Jan Ross, he, um, he took off with a long to go. So, um, Well, we're having a few problems with the mic, but we'll get Stephen back in again and uh, get his information. I've read my notes. There they are, Stephen. Are you on? You go again? Off you go. <laughs> yes, in 1982, I finished second in the Amstel Gold Race behind uh, Jan Ras, who took off in the final kilometre. But um, I left it a bit too late, and the, the finish line I was about, about four yards behind him. So it was a very disappointing classic for myself. Yes, Mike, I should have read more closely here. I've marked you down in green on my notebook here, second in 82. Uh, so that's the best, certainly, because Kelly had a third and a fourth. And there you are, uh, watching the racing here with us. Where it's been absolutely flat out. I've seen some cracking speed today. As ever again, the Gavis Balan up the front. We've had four and five men driving hard ever since that early breakaway group of Chiesa, Capella and Fernando Pinero were pulled back. Their three to five minutes wasn't enough, really, on this very, very tricky course uh, with the climbs today, the 29th version having no less than 28 climbs. Now, you see what they've just gone over here, the, um, th those uh, little uh, white, black and white sections. These are the traffic calming that they're putting in Holland in this day and age to slow down uh, the, the traffic through the cities. They have them in France at the moment also, but they're, they're much bigger. And I can tell you when you're riding along on your bike, it makes a big difference to to the road, it becomes very dangerous also when you're riding along in a, in a big group. Uh, when you're in the front, it's okay, but when you're behind about 60, 70 places back and you hit this, uh, these jumps, it's very dangerous. Well, this is Johan Mazeo. I thought he'd gone somewhere off the front. And uh, so with Johan Mazeo trying to pull back uh, the, the leader, Ken Galta, he just nipped off. We saw him go, and then the camera decided to go back and, and stick with the rest of them. But Mazeo trying the lone ride. He looks a bit sluggish just at the moment. So let's see. Uh, how he's going to perform today. He's got a rather laborious style. He has. It's also He's also riding a, a very big gear. He's supposed to be using 53 with a 14 behind. So um, uh, as he's using such a big gear and there's still 50-odd uh, uh, kilometers to the finish, I think it's possibly a sign of, of fatigue. So, um, uh, and also the final in the Amstel goal race is also very difficult. We arrive on the circuit at the finish. And uh, there's two very steep hills on the circuit, and normally a lot of crosswinds. Well, there we are then. 64 kilometres yet to go on the course today. Just slightly altered at the finish, uh, just putting in 28 climbs this time against 26 it was last time. But uh, nevertheless, a little tough old course as far as these rides are concerned. And we've got 66 kilometres covered. A quick look at the map here. So we've the Klimen climb and then Valkenberg yet to come. Well, when we get to that one, I'm sure that Steve knows his way up that one. It's been featuring in so many races. This, but, and is that the bold Charlie going through? Charlie Motte. It is. A Charlie mm. Motte going, having go, yeah. Charlie's had a great season this year. It's his last season, and he wants it to be the best season. But he had a fantastic win in Paris Nice a few weeks back. And um, like a credit to himself, like he's 33, almost 34 years of age this year. It's, uh, he's still young, but he um, uh, can certainly show off to a lot of the young French riders at the moment. Everybody's waiting for them, likes of uh, Pascal Dino and the likes of Beyank and all these guys. Um, Charlie being one of the older uh, uh, generations, having a great season so far. And Mazeo has caught up uh, our early leader, Bruno Kingelta, and snuffled him up on his way through here. So he's now been hauled back into that, uh, that uh, breakaway. The two of them now with the big field behind them. So just now being caught Kingelta by uh, Mazeo, puts two men in front, a gap of something around about 30 seconds, it would appear to us. The Amstead goal race, 30 seconds is not very much because uh, towards the end there's an awful lot of long straight roads but as you can see at the moment they we're going through towns and um, uh, at the moment it's, it is to their advantage to be in the front because the group behind the chasing group behind cannot go very much faster than these guys whereas when you get through all these towns and you come out onto the big wide open roads again uh, 30 seconds is very little 
And it's splitting again. Charlie tried to go away at the front and seems to have uh, sorted them out a little bit. But nevertheless, they've, they've uh, come back up to him again. And here we go. It's actually strange that there's um, very little communication between the, the, the four riders because uh, normally, I, if I was in a break like that, I would have been trying to ride it to catch the front guys or keep away from the back guys, but at least try and communicate and then hopefully in the final then uh, take off. But there's still uh, 60 kilometers to go and they're attacking already. Well, it's been like that so far all the way through. Attack, attack, attack. This has been a very... It started quite slowly, really, and now with 63 kilometers to go towards the end of the race, uh, just, what, just over 30 miles or such, 35 miles or so left in this race, and the, the pace has not slackened since they caught that three-man breakaway group at the front, despite the severity of these short, sharp little hills. It's amazing because all these sharp hills, the repetition of them, they really gets to you. And the Amstel Gold Race being one of the longest uh, classics now on the calendar after the FS from Liege and uh, Milan San Remo. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not a very... It's, it is very unusual that the riders actually go flat out for so long Normally, everybody knowing that the end and the final is, is so difficult, they always try to take off reasonably, reasonably slow. But so far in the Amstel today, it's been um, all going all day. And it split the field yet again, so that little regroup we saw down the road when the 13 men got joined by something like about another 30 or 40 has uh, had its effect, and suddenly they've gone and split themselves back up yet again. So, Charlie Motte, Look at his lips in apprehension. He looks quite comfortable, doesn't he? He does look very comfortable. The surprising part about it is the lads are not, not getting on together like Skibby. It's in his own interest to do well here because TVM being a Dutch team, I'm sure he would like to be to do well. I'm sure he's un under orders to, to do his best. Uh, whereas um, the, the riders don't seem to be having a, having a good time together. There's no real communication. There's no, um, no getting on together, which is, of course, to the advantage of these two in the front. Uh, and I believe Skibby didn't ride last year this particular race because he crashed in the uh, one of the early season races and did his shoulder blade in and, and in fact also cracked his skull and had a coma and was out of action for some time so uh, Skibby I think wanted to do well in this race this time in front of his Dutch sponsors with these two now wondering if they've got sufficient gap to carry on we'll have to wait and see Well, there we are then. These two riders still with that lead of something like about 30 seconds as the uh, field behind. Wondering, I suppose, what they've got to do about this one. Certainly, uh, there's Kasani in this little group uh, for GBMG. And he, uh, Kasani, will not aid this little group to try and get up to uh, the leading twosome because his teammate, GBMG rider Museo, is in that one. For Gavis Balan at the moment at the front, then we've got uh, Kengi Alta, and he's also got one of his teammates sat back here as well, so that's going to be some aid to him. And uh, again, uh, uh, the boys can surely see the two, two lads in the front, so it makes it easier. As you can see, they're riding here uh, in a, what we call an echelon where you have uh, the wind coming from the left here in this case, so it means that the, each rider must change on the right-hand side, and the purpose of this being to get as much shelter as you possibly can from the front rider who is, who is breaking the wind. You don't get much shelter behind Charlie, though, do you? I mean, you might do, but Skippy's about another half as big, isn't he? That's why I'm sure there's some fighting going on for Skippy's wheel at the moment. <laughs> Not everybody knowing that Skippy being the, the tallest man in the bunch, that um, there's plenty of shelter behind him. You can see the, the group, main group is not, still not uh, too far behind them. They still haven't uh, called it a day. They're going to ha still have a go. Like I was saying earlier, in the small roads, it's very difficult to, to gain time because the big group cannot go any, small, any faster than the small group. But now we're back onto the wide roads again. Uh, and um, this means that uh, we can see the riders in the front and the, the group can get organised. So here we have Joan Mazeo at the back of the little group here. He finished 13th in the Amstel Gold last year, 2nd in 92, 10th in 91, and 9th in 1990, and 31st way back in uh, 1988. So he's got a tremendous amount of experience in this one. And according to my little notes here, uh, Bruno uh, Kegialta hasn't actually ridden, or he hasn't actually finished in the Amstel Gold, if my notes are correct. So it's quite a new experience for him, but as far as Mazeo is concerned, 
he's very much at home. Knowledge of the course, does that have an effect? Uh, definitely it does. This part of the course actually at the moment is where the World Champions were held. If I remember back in 1978, I rode for Ireland as an amateur. I think I finished up in the first 20 or something. Like that. And Robert Miller finished fourth actually. So the riders, most of the riders know this road well because in the one or two races that we have got in, in, uh, in Holland, uh, we often pass uh, this famous park that everybody knows of Volkens, Volkens ride. And that was the one, I think, 78, when uh, Jan Raas won, what I mentioned earlier on, when he was riding for the, the rally team. And Jan, of course, is a team manager in this race now for the World Perfect team, five times winner of the race. And uh, at that World Championship, uh, that he won that one, uh, beating Didi Turo, the German rider, uh, to the p uh, who fell with an almighty crash. I remember that one coming to the finish, and the whole of Holland went absolutely mad. Another world champion that's won this particular race too, uh, Henny Kuiper, uh, Jan uh, Juk Zodemilk in the Victor's Rostrum too as well. So we've got a lot of talent here, and I've been looking back in the days. The first man to ever win this race, in fact, was uh, Jean Stablinski, the French rider, who is still about. We see him out on the Tour de France. We saw him the other week up on uh, the Paris Bar, I think it was. We spot him out there, and uh, Jean still uh, interested in the cycle sport, and his son very much involved in the bicycle business. Actually, they import bikes under Jean Stablinski's name. And if you go into a supermarket in France, you'll find lots of bikes there with Stablinski all over them, champion of the world, and those are imported by his son and sold in, in large numbers. A bit more background for you from the cycle tray. Muzo. You can see, as I was saying earlier yeah. on, he, he was riding a big gear because he was tired, but you can see it now. It's quite evident that he is tired because uh, this hill here is a hill where normally it's like a, it's a good fall flat where you be going over it in the 52, 53, maybe 17, 18 and uh, he's actually struggling at the moment and you can see um, uh, he's much more uh, not, as, not as stylish as the, as, the, as, the, as the guy behind him you can stick, compare the two styles uh, very easy when you can see it on the screen and you can see he's having, he's having difficulty but it'll be interesting to see now if this group uh, comes back on because we have David Cassani and um, the other teammate of uh, Givisa so um, it'll be very interesting to see now when they, when they come back when they come back, uh, who's going to ride? Are they going to attack or, or whatever? Well, the John Rees sent up as a bit of a marksman here as well because Ken Galton in that leading group, not going to do anything to aid the chase, nor in fact is uh, Kassai in the last two. So it's all down to Skibby and to Motte to do the work. Well, the other two are getting a bit of a toe now. Not see Bjorn Rees in action. We haven't seen a lot of him so far, being drafted in to the, uh, the team of the uh, Gavis Ballon, presumably for the tours yet to come. Well, like last year he finished fifth in the Tour de France and he showed uh, that he has definitely got ability to ride well in, in, uh, in state races. So, um, uh, but last week we saw him also in the SS and the he had a very, very good ride, but he had a different role. He was riding as domestic for Argentina last week. So um, it paid off in the end then when, uh, when um, Berzin won at the SS and so um, you can see here again, he's very, very comfortable on the bike compared to the, to the other guys. And Skibby, well, he certainly likes the, the uphill bits, believe it or not, though he's a very tall chap indeed. He won that stage in the Tour de France last year at Evro, which is a long drag up, so like a thousand kilometres of climbing at the end of it all. So again, he's a sort of character that can, can use the long drags to his advantage, but the, the tandem they're towing behind here, Cassani, and there is certainly a threat because both these two all-round riders just get a nice little tow sitting in there doing next to nothing. And I had Sidi tapping the side of his nose, Cassani on my list as a possible winner today. I hadn't got uh, Motte or Skibby in there, but uh, Bunyo has been tipped with the five stars in the papers being the likely winner today. Ferl and Armstrong were tipped just behind him. Shandri, Cassani and Ballerini were the next to go. So of the leading group at the moment, uh, Cassani is the one that perhaps could do something about this one. But that little bunch behind, regrouping, uh, not got them in sight. The last time check we had some 35 seconds back to the little group containing Motte and about another 15 seconds of this one. Can you imagine that group came back now and in the end uh, uh, Bjorn Rees was having a, was going to win it was going to win the Amsterdam Gold Race. We'd have had three Italian, three, three riders from the same team winning the three major classics between the Espresso and the Age, Fresh Wallon and the Amsterdam Gold Race. Well, that will be quite a turn up for the books. We'll have to wait and see. I'm not sure that um, it, it, there's only one rider. In fact, Eddie Merckx has won the Liège Boston Liège and the Amstel Gold. He, he won it in, uh, both of them in '73 and '75. Uh, Argentine winner of the Flesh 
probably isn't in with the shout today, so that's another little record that uh, Eddie Mertz can keep. And not much difficulty to get away at the front there for that one rider. They must be uh, easing back a bit. Well, I wouldn't say he got away without any difficulty because I'm sure they're riding <laughs> when they're actually stopped behind, as you can see. If they're actually stopped, uh, the power wasn't really on, they would be all more or less compact together, where you can see they're all in twos and threes, so it was meant that there was a little bit of speed on it. But um, I think everybody behind knows that it's still a fair bit to go. The major teams in the race today, everybody knows that the, the GWS team is going to be the, one of the most uh, strongest contenders for the race today, and you have already got two men up the road. So um, it'll be interesting to see now who rides behind. We have also with Musio behind in front, we have a GB in front. So they are the, the two most important teams at the moment for the classics. So unfortunately, in one, state, one part, that. Um, we have uh, two of the major teams in the race with two riders in the front. But um, like I said earlier on, behind, uh, uh, no one's going to give up. As you can see here from the helicopter, there's uh, two groups coming together now. And it would appear that one lone rider who might have been one of the riders from the, uh, 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 the Motorola team, it looks like he slipped off the front then, but has been very quickly pulled back in again by the, uh, by the chasers who are splitting under the pressure. So a moment of, uh, of calm, and then they suddenly had another little go to try and get away. So let's see what, uh, what happens this time round. And uh, there we are. Right, so there's a two-man group at the front. Mazzeo and uh, Kengi We're having a few problems, by the way, uh, which I will issue myself with the, the, uh, the microphones here with, with, with Stephen early on the programme. He's joined me now and we're still trying to sort it out. So this is the one, though, isn't it? I mean, this is a cracking climb, isn't it? Well, this group then are trying to climb up to the leaders, the Dutch flags of the supporters from Holland urging on the man in the yellow jersey at the moment, but certainly uh, the main riders, uh, Tunisa and Rooks, as far as the Dutch are concerned, have been really sorted out in this little uh, group so far. And uh, now at the front still the two leaders, way over the top of the climb. and. Well, let's see what's going on now then. And the attempt from the rest of the field to close down on the breakaways has caused the thing to split. And yet again, Furlan and uh, Armstrong are showing to be the tough men. Chamil is up there as well. It looks like Gianni Bunyo has fought his way through. So Bunyo up there to Chamil. Up in front then was uh, Armstrong. And then we have uh, Furlan as well chasing after the, the fragmented people up in front. This race really has come apart, as we'd expect, on the climb of the Coburg. Now, it's a tired little group here, this four men, with uh, Bunyo second place last year. Yep. And Stephen seems to be having trouble with the microphone. He's going tap, tap, tap with his fingers, showing that he's taking it so easy, Bunyo, sitting there on a lowish gear, twiddling his way up again at the moment. And uh, so let's have a look now up on the front. Well, Kengi Alta's in that little group. Hang on, we'll just check there. It looks like they might well have been caught. Yeah, there's Mazzeo. They have, in fact, been caught. Our camera's uh, dwelling upon the chase from behind. So Mazzeo and uh, Kengi Alta have been caught then by that little group that was chasing them down. There is um, Kasani having a word with Mazzeo. 
The man who did all the work at the front end, Ken Gialta now, saying, Seddy, Bjorn Reese up there with him, and Skibby, and there, Motte at the back. They were the, the four men that uh, chased down the, um, the leaders. And so another, another regrouping coming on. And that's a nice little compact group now. And Bunyo on the front, driving it along. Sorry, Veron Ver can go yeah, across the gap for Festina. As the rain began to come down, that might, uh, in fact, put the mockers on some of the chaps behind. But certainly Verank then decided to try and close that gap down. We were talking about who was going to do the chasing to pull back the leaders. And he's decided to have a go at it. And you said earlier on he's been, <laughs> it's been headstrong. Is this another example? It is, definitely. Verank, uh, uh, he never says die. <laughs> like he'll always go after the boat and try and swim after it. Like he's a kind of a guy, he'd be sitting back in the bunch and nice and comfortable. And all of a sudden the break is gone, he wake up and say, oh, the break is gone. And he will, like, in the Tour de France last year, break it 15 minutes at the road. And Verang tried to have a go after on his own. Well, it's splitting up in front as well now, so perhaps he's chosen just the right time to go, because Motte isn't going to chase this one down at all at the moment. Uh, nor is, is Gotti at the back then for the uh, Pulte team. And who's gone down the road? I think it's one of the Gavis Belan riders uh, in this little group. And let's see who we have at the front, because certainly Rue is in this one, the little uh, the chap from Gan. And yes, he's and gone. And as ever. Bruno Rees, Bruno Rees. <laughs> We were talking about him earlier on. He's looking very, very comfortable on the bike. So, um... Uh, who's going to chase now? Does the, the GB are going to chase, maybe, from Utsio? They've al already ridden a, a very, very good race for the moment. So I uh, have to get anything left in the legs to, to, to ride this group down. Uh, it split suddenly. That's a very nice move as far as these two riders are concerned. And both of them quite strong, because Reese has got a fair, you know, fairly strong turn of, of, of pressure, hasn't he, at the moment? He's rolling quite nicely. He has, and he's, he's going very well at the moment. And the, the sprint uh, today will, will suit him also. Rue is a good sprinter also, but I think for my money, if, if it came to a finish, because you must remember, there's still a long way to go yet. I think that's... Uh, <laughs> that's a bit hilly too, isn't it? It is, yeah. Like, Reyes is very strong, and I, th I think he could actually um, out-sprint Rue if it came down to a sprint. He was surprised to me last year in the Tour de France, Reyes, how well he climbed, because it didn't seem in previous years to have had that, that climbing ability. I mean, is this something that you learn over years? Uh, but he, he was up there always, there or thereabouts, wasn't he? He was. Like, you don't finish fifth in the Tour de France if you're not some kind of a climber. Like he rode very, very well, and in time trials he came out very well. He was riding very well in the sprints. He was riding well all around, as we see here, Verank coming back to this group. So it'll be interesting now to see if he'll just sit on it or if he goes straight through. For my money, he'll he probably go straight through because... Uh, You're right. <laughs> yeah, you see, <laughs> you, you come because he knows, he knows that if he sits on it, this group is doomed. So if he sits, sits in the group, uh, uh, he don't, won't go anywhere. So it means he's after attacking and getting across. And uh, But unfortunately, the... Um, the Jewish riders have something else in mind. They, they know that uh, uh, if Ryan goes across on his own, it'll be another man in the front. So they don't want that. Um. But um, this, is the, this is the sad part because Ryan, he was having a go on his own. He caught this group on his own. And now he, he must sit here because he knows that if he rides on his own, it's... it's it's um, He'll be counter, countered later on. And all that worked for nothing because here comes the group he's just left. Yeah. So... Um, but that was kind of on the cards. I don't know why everybody's looking round, because here we are, uh, Pansak no. has a go, and, and uh, obviously the policeman from Gavis has now got to keep eyes all over the place, haven't they? Because you look how he's marking now. Nice move there, isn't it? Yeah. Pansak had a go first, and uh, for a bluff, to see who was, what was going to happen. He saw nobody reacting and tried to continue, so the, the Gavis riders went straight onto his wheel. And Musa has tried to drift up as well. Uh, up in front, then one foot Gan to put you in the picture. Uh, there's no Gan riders in this field at all, so Paul Rue hasn't got any assistance. The Gavis Bellan, this is a pale blue jersey here, the electrical company, and uh, Bellan are in, I think, the, the, the ceramics business. They make uh, uh, tiles and so on. So they've got uh, the, the leading group, we've got one up there from Gavis Bellan and one from Gan. And there's a fair number of Gavis Bellan riders in this one at the moment, so it must be up to GPMG. Well, for the moment, in the last couple of classics, GB have been very, very strong. Uh, and also the fact that they're riding in, in Holland. Holland is not very far from Belgium, so they're practically riding on, on their own home grounds. But still, it's um, who's going to ride from the, from the GB, GB team if they are going to ride. It is 30-odd in this group now, and there's three GB riders, riders in it. If they ride, well, they're definitely going to get blown out in the end. Uh, and if they can ride, there's only two of them can ride out of the three. They must keep Muzio for the finish. So two men are riding against uh, the riders in the front with all these riders sitting in the wheel. And 
there's no way they can get it back. The only way they can come back now is, is if there's a combination. If there's, if, if the kind of, the, um, if, uh, <laughs> there we go, you're made off again, you there see. Again, he yeah. keeps dipping off down the front, so Varanka's had another go. Uh, it depends who goes with him. And also, also Rooks has got up to that one, so some of the people well off the back have now started to come through. And Rooks, desperately keen to perform as the best Dutchman in the race today. He's doing what he can now. It looks, it's either Rooks or Skibby's got hammering off the front, so uh, Rooks could have some help from Skibby, I'd have thought, in this one, because the Dutch desperately want to get a man in, the, in, in that uh, top three place and get a podium. But two down the road at the moment are uh, away. And that's Roof and the, the GAN team together with Bjorn Rees riding for Gavis Bilan. So we've got one Frenchman and one Danish rider. And here they are. And they really are rolling. They are. They're definitely giving it everything. We saw earlier on that Bruno Rees was looking very well in the wheels. Where you can, you can see now <laughs> that uh, he is actually going very, very well. We get a close look, look at his bike now. You can see his bike's actually a titanium bike. It's actually a new titanium bike which they, which they have uh, in Italy with it. The actually, um, aluminium rims. These are new, very new profile rims as you have there from Campagnolo, and it makes the wheel very, very strong. And also, I was reading that uh, within that Team Time Trial situation we saw in the Fresh Valone on Wednesday when they had three riders in there, that they're worth about a couple of seconds per kilometre by the way in which the aerodynamic shape of the Chamel rim takes him through. So at the moment, Reese having that advantage. He's ridden this race twice in the past, by the way, 1986 finished 25th, and in 1993 last year finished Swatotnuff, 69. Yeah, it was to be safe, yeah, because uh, now I've got uh, GBMG doing the chasing down. They have to, they have to chase. If they don't chase now, it, um, they won't get them back on. But they're, they're chasing for Musio, but Musio has already had a very hard day. This group is actually broken, it has. Yeah, this group is actually in the front. So actually, this is good now, good move now by GB, because uh, uh, Musio, um, Musio will, will definitely, definitely ride now with Saligari yep. because... Uh, Sally Gary is a very, very good team, ri team rider. He knows he only rides for, for the team. He doesn't never rides for himself. So Musio having Sally Gary with him down the front is a great advantage to him. But then on the other hand, they've, uh, they have uh, somebody sitting on the back carrier again, and uh, <laughs> in one way is demoralising. Yeah. Well, Sally Gary having had that puncture just when we came on air so about a couple of hours ago, the poor chap had to fight his way back into the, the group. And he's obviously found a new lease of life to work his way up to his team leader. Well, he's, he's brain number five, Mazzeo, but uh, team leader Kasani for the day. But Mazzeo probably being the one they're tipping to win. And these are our two leaders at the moment. And you can see why the uh, GBMG have got a passenger, because still yet again here, uh, Bjorn Rees on the front for Gavis Balan. And they've got to 32 kilometres to go. Uh, and that is some 20 miles of racing left ahead of them. It's 20 miles, but it's still a two. Very, very steep hills to come, and the last one is only about six kilometers from the finish. So it is very interesting to see how we arrive at this, um, how we arrive at uh, the last hill, and who's, who, who's the strong men will definitely come to the front end. Well, these two lads have got nothing to lose at the moment. I say, as far as uh, um, race is concerned, only 69th last year in this race, and so. He's going to go away or better, whatever happens today, because that chasing group behind him is only something like about 20 strong, and the pressure's on then. This man looks remarkably comfortable, doesn't he? He does look very, very comfortable. In my opinion, the race is not over yet, because uh, there's too many riders behind and too many strong riders that haven't even put the nose out uh, in the wind so far. I'd say that like, either GB don't ride behind, but we could see happening here in the last 20 kilometers. So is the group getting away with a strong rider like Bunyo or an Armstrong or uh, one of these riders or a Capucci maybe getting away and uh, chasing this group down? I, I, I find it hard to, to imagine this group actually going to the finish. Well, we haven't had a recent time check of that. The, uh, the cap they're opening up as far as they're concerned, but they're rolling both of them very well indeed. And uh, the chasing group after them with the Gavis uh, passengers, and that's the way. Here we are, looking back in there. We see the passenger at the back there for Gavis Balan. Not going to do any of the work then, but Saligari and Mazzeo start to chase this one down. And uh, that's good team tagging yet again. Cenk Yalto, who was uh, away on his own way back down the road, so it doesn't look like that's tired him, but certainly he's happy to sit in this little group at the moment and, uh, and watch the work go through. Well, at the moment, the Chivas team have been dominating everywhere. Everybody's asking themselves, uh, what must we do to tire these lads out? You know, when you have a group of one, two, even three of them in it, in the flesh well under was three of them in the front group. So um, everybody's asking themselves now, well, you know, what do we do to beat these guys? They're, they're so strong. They, they go on breaks and they go back and they're still strong. 
So um, <laughs> they, yes, even as we see, go on their own. Don't they still come back? It's terrific, isn't it? They do, yeah. Well, they're up. That's a little time check. Waiting for that one. Then 52 seconds back to that uh, three-man group, and well over a minute to what's left of the main field. That's quite useful. But on these little climbs, is it bridgeable? Oh, I think so. Like I said earlier on, if you get um, like these riders in the front are on their own, but Bunyo was sitting in the wheels behind. So one minute gap is not very much for a rider like Bunyo, who, who is in very good condition at the moment. He could try and jump across it, but definitely if he jumps across on his own, it may be difficult. He'd have to jump across with somebody like Capucci or an Armstrong or, or somebody like this. And if Bunyo gets away with an Armstrong or with a Capucci, they will, the three of them will ride. But they won't get away on their own, of course. There'll definitely be um, a G Wiz rider with them or an MGB rider, an MG, uh, sorry, a GB rider with them. So, um, but still, it's if you need at least two strong riders, three strong riders behind for a big gap. It, it, it a bit sounds to me like some of these cyclists, Stephen, they could make good poker players, couldn't they? The way they sort of decide whether this, that, or the other should happen. And um, hello, we've got a bit Ger of a change Ger here. Rue. Yeah. Gerard Rue is, is where is he? Where's this group? Gerard Rue, behind here. Yeah. And as ever, look what they've got at the back here, sitting on the wheels. And he had another one of the uh, Gavis Balan teams, and I think that's Volpe at the moment. Gerard Rue was riding quite well in the, in the flesh uh, during it's the week. Volpe, yeah. Yep, it's Volpe. <laughs> every, every time we go back, there's a Gavis Balan either in the lead or in the, in the little, little group acting as, uh, as passenger, hey? Isn't there, at, the mo at the moment, they're very, very good passengers. Uh, we, we can say so, but I'm sure the other riders, like Sophia Hank and Rue, or whether it be uh, Musio in the front or Saint themselves, well, these guys are very heavy baggage because you can't, can't go anywhere without them, and it, it, um, I'm sure it upsets them. What, what does it feel like then, Steve, when you're doing the work and you're towing somebody like this? Uh, I mean, I mean, animosity, is, is that the right word? Well, uh, unfortunately... It's team tactic as such, but there must be a, in your deep in your gut just feeling, well, no, this is not nice. Well, I can, I can never sit down anyway. I was always fortunate enough to be the leader, yeah. and I always kind of calculated, even if I put you out at the road, I looked, looked around me first and saw who I was with and thought, well, okay, if I bring him across, he won't beat Capucci in the front, so I can bring him across. But um, on the on the other hand, you know, it's uh, for the riders like Rue or Vianne who are riding here with these guys sitting on the on the back of them, they say to themselves, well, if I give it 100%, when I get across to the group, well, they're going to be attacked. So it's difficult for them to give it 100%. Well, now, uh, Museo up here at the front has got uh, Sally Gali with him, as far as GBMG are concerned. They've now got some help coming up because Varanka's made it across that little gap together with uh, Jaru. We hadn't actually seen much of Varu uh, in the past um, because uh, he must have come up to that little group, so one wonders just how strong he is at the moment, right? It is, but it's, can you imagine now we have the, um, uh, the two riders in the front with a GWS in it? And now we have one, two, three, four, five, six riders behind with two GWS riders. So um, hopefully we'll not see another one, two, and three as we saw in the, in the flesh well, and hopefully, um, hopefully things will be changed. But um, at this moment in time, it's uh, 20 odd, less than 20, 20 miles to go, and uh, it's, it's unfortunate. Like we have, uh, we have now Gerard Rui, we have uh, uh, Sally Gary, have Musio in this group, uh, and uh, they know themselves, they give it 100% to get across to the group, but definitely they'd be counter counter, counter They put counter three goose balance in there, isn't it? Three goose balance. Exactly. Well, they've, they've got to drive. There's no alternative, surely, as far as uh, was own uh, concerned, but to go after these two, surely. They have to, like, um, Sally Gary's actually sacrificing himself because they, they, they know that if, they do, if nobody sacrifices themselves, they won't get back. At least by doing this, if they get across, well, Musio still has a chance of doing well. And like it's also, this race is not an individual race, it's also a team race. And with being a team race, also you must be having your sponsor's name on the front as well. So it's, um, you're all the time uh, thinking, well, first of all yourself, first then your sponsor, and then your, your team. Well, there we are then, this chasing group, some 40 seconds back on the two men down the road. There you are. Yet again, having uh, two men sat at the back of this one after that regroupment of the chasers. And uh, they're sitting on the back, having a nice little race. You can see the helicopter in the distance. That's where the two leaders are. And back behind this little group, which you see here, just another 20 seconds or so is what's left of the main field. That 20 seconds, though, that's surely not enough, is it, for this lot to stay away? No, we can see now that um, the lot like Rue, Vierheink and Musio, they're riding very hard on the front. Their tempo's actually up. So normally we should see them bringing back the, the front group now in a, in a short while if they keep riding, uh, as I say, because they, they know that they ride 100%, 
and they catch the group. When they do catch the full group, the first hill they come to, they're going to be counter-attacked by one of these riders from the GBS team. So, um, the, the race is not over yet for the front guys, uh, but um, we cannot say yet that a, a, a GBS rider has not won because um, once they catch the riders in front, it would mean there'll be three GBS riders in the front group, so one of them is definitely going to counter-attack. Counter, counter and quite a League of Nations this time, as far as give us concern, because they've got the uh, Danish rider uh, Bjorn Rees with them, so it isn't all an Italian benefit. And of course, uh, they've been carrying with them people like Young Berzin as well from uh, Moldavia, from uh, Russia. So certainly the, the Italian team, but a mixed bag of riders. And here we have the uh, Danish rider up in front with the French on his wheel. Definitely, it's uh, th these riders now after being in front for so long, they're still riding very, very strong. Like Rees, you can look at the, the style of him at the moment. He's just the pedal is just rolling around. It's, it looks like he's giving, up, having a, he's just riding the pedal just going around effortless at the moment. They're very equally matched, looking at the size of the frames too. Oh, <laughs> he took his front wheel then. Um, both about the same size, aren't they? Rather these little what I call short, punchy mountain climbers. They're, they're, they're towards the tall end. Yeah, well, this is a type of rider that suits the classics because uh, uh, a mountain climber, a guy that rides very well in the mountains, will also always be the stocky rider. Where the riders that win the classics, the likes of Jan Ras, who was also a tall man, Kletterman was also a tall man, Moser was also a tall man. The, the, the riders that they can have, a, they can have, they're very, very strong for short periods. Whereas you must be to go over these hills you have in Holland for the Amstel Gold Race or the Headfall or the Athos in the Asia or Fleshwell on, you have to be this kind of rider, a small, stocky rider, or not a stock stocky rider, but a, a, a tall rider with plenty of power. And the Amstel, they are coming up. Um, Amstel promoting this race. Amstel Beer, big uh, brewery in Holland, and one of their vehicles just gone thundering through. And the, this is quite a fair-sized bunch. There's it a lot of come up to them, hasn't it? We they? saw Ikimov in there. We saw uh, Connie Chef. Uh, um, a lot of riders have come back from there from behind, which means that uh, the, the group, the group, this, this group here, was not actually riding too hard because uh, these stragglers, uh, not stragglers, but the, the, the third group, uh, were able to get back on again. Well, concentrating here on uh, Rooks, uh, riding up as far as the Dutch are concerned, their best chance, just having a good look at uh, Motorola rider Lance Armstrong. I think it looks as if he's got his, uh, his thing stuck in his ears for some communication with the car, but I can't spot it, man. They've been using this radio communication, but I couldn't spot the little, little thing going to his ears, little plug, but he's sitting in this one at the moment, uh, and Rooks on his wheel. Charlie Motte has drifted back to that group, which is a fairly substantial number of riders um, in this uh, little pack here. The last time check we had, they were uh, well over a minute down the two leaders uh, and a chasing group in between just at some 40 seconds. They were up, Jamil, the World Cup, and... Oh, ah, he's got back, because earlier on Ludwig was, was struggling like crazy. He's managed to get back there. Ballerini is also back in this little group. So quite a number of riders have made their way back that we hadn't seen for an awful long time. So hostilities must have uh, let go a bit. Ekimov sitting in there too, and Skibby rolling away at the front, probably working on behalf of... Uh, uh, of Rooks and well, here Kipuchi as well. Here we have uh, the same problem again. We have, uh, we have Skibby riding in the front. Uh, on his right hand side, we have uh, on the left hand side of your screen, we have Cassani who is defending for uh, Musioa. And nobody else wants to ride because it'd be no well to ride in the front means towing everybody across. And, so and Ludwig's come up too because actually. He, um, Way back, he was he was struggling somewhat, and yes, all the GBMG really coming on the front, aren't they? Right? They are. They're, they're, they're all there, okay, but uh, they're defending the place of Musio who and, and Saligari, who is in the who is in the front. But um, uh, there's still a long way to go yet, and this group is not doesn't look to be well enough organised to to have any intention of um, bringing down the, bringing back the front group. Ludwig on home territory really, lived in Valkenburg, now moved over to Aachen, so he knows these roads very well indeed, but knowing him isn't just a matter of racing over them, you need the strength in your legs, and he's, he's been through a bad patch, he's come back up to the front of this pack now, and Ludwig then trying to drive this thing along, uh, he won the race in 1992 when he beat Johan Mazeo, Konishev was also in this race, was in third place, Colotti uh, fourth and Lukbrus and those riders also in the race, but not in contention at the moment, Ludwig's the only one who'd like to try and get across, this we're looking at is the is it mid-group? Yes, it is. It's the middle group. And uh, looks like Varank has now drifted off the front, and they're leaving up to GBMG to do most of the work together with uh, Gerard Roux and the Gruis Ballan again up for the ride. The group seems to, seem to have started off to be riding very, very well, but um, now they seem to be... don't seem to be putting the same effort into it. Earlier on, we saw Rube riding through with Virhaink and with Saligari and with Monsieur, 
and uh, now he's not riding through at all. As we see again, uh, Rue, uh, Brun, uh, Rue, You've Rue and Rue. <laughs> Rue and Reese. <laughs> Rue and Reese, yeah. yeah. And Rue back it's in the group. Born, Ru, born uh, it's actually uh, born, it's terrible as um, a tongue twister. Yeah. But um, they, are, they are riding very, very well together. They haven't, uh, normally at this stage, when you get to 20 kilometers from the finish, you start looking at each other and say, well, he's better than me in the sprint or whatever. So in this situation, I, think I feel the two of them feel that I'm as strong as him and he's as strong as me. So um, they have an equal chance of doing well. Here we see Bonia riding a huge gear. Earlier on, we saw him, he was riding fast on a small gear. And now he's riding along the points, riding along at maybe uh, 40 kilometers an hour, and he has that uh, possibly uh, 13 on. And he's got uh, Pansac for company, and the gap's still about the same, 40 to one group, then 140 to the pack behind that. And we've still got these three climbs yet ahead of us, 28 climbs in all today, and they've got to go the uh, Hallam Hay, the uh, St. Pierre, and then Petersburg. And Petersburg, the last climb, just coming in the uh, final kilometres of the race. So the tough stuff and some legs could bend yet a while. It's not all over by any means if they just get their act together. But it seems to be very difficult to get a concerted chase. And they're all perhaps hoping against hope that the two leaders will die a thousand deaths and it'll all come back together. But they look very powerful last time we saw them. And I'm very pleased by that Armstrong's been riding. Every time we've been watching uh, on Eurosport some of these uh, Classics now, Stephen. He, he, he's in there. He started the season rather badly, but he seems to be very careful the way he, he reads these races now. He is. He's, he's riding very well, but at the same time, he's 1 minute 40 back on the leaders. This group here is 40 seconds down on the leaders, but uh, Armstrong is 140 down, so it's his chance, I think, of, uh, of coming back to the front group are uh, rather slimmer. Yeah. But then, like, being 140 down, it means a minute down on this group, and they're not, not riding, so they could finish. I can't see them coming back to this group now at the moment. I think our winner we will see in this group or else in the group of, uh, of Rees and, uh, and Rue. I think um, but that's if they very come difficult together, to come though, back. Uh, it's actually come down, uh, according to my watch, down to 30 seconds. They've lost another 10 on this little group here. If they come together and we've got three Guiz Balan riders in and, and the rest of the, the chaps here, uh, in fact, there are, I think there's yeah, three of them, surely there'll be a... And let's give Isabel and Far somewhere down the road an indecision which will help that gap come up. Well, I think the, the, the like if, uh, the, for example, if there was no GWS riders in this group, I think that the two riders in the front would have been caught long ago. But the problem is, the likes of Rue, um, Gerard Rue, Seligari, and also Nuzio, they know that if they ride the right balls out in this group, they're going to catch the two in front, and then the, immediately there'll be a counter attack from one of the, the GWS riders. So they're, they're, they're very reluctant to give it 100%. Well, here we are. These are our two leaders. The gap is coming down. It's now to 30 seconds under the impetus of the GBMG. And uh, Rhys looking back then, the Gavis Bellan rider, and with him, who the man who's got everything to lose if they get caught, of course, is young Rue on the front now because he can't allow that lot to come up and be swallowed up and be outnumbered by the Gavis Bellan. So he's still working away. And Rhys is the keen to come through. I'm just wondering whether Reese is still driving this one hard enough. Let's see what he goes through this time. Here's, here's information coming up then from the commissaire to tell him what the gap is back, and I think Reese has said, yep, you'll still go on with it. But they are riding well together, but uh, they have been away now for 20-odd kilometres, uh, the two of them together. So, um, like, you can be sure, like, it's, it's not as if you're riding, if you're riding on your own, uh, or riding in a group is different, whereas the two of them being together in the front, they're definitely Definitely having, definitely tired of it this, this moment, and I'm sure with the change in the weather there as well, it was very, very good early on, and now that there's a couple of raindrops, it's um, it changes, it's just the, the everything as well. And uh, Ludwig looking very, very powerful, it, it transformed for what he was, and it looks like he slipped off the front of that group, and he's got a minute's gap to jump though between the the, the main pack he was with and the people chasing down the two in front. So it, here we are. Ludwig on his own, a good Roman, something like, what, 36, Roman sprinter, 36 days in the peace race, Olympic champion as well. A tremendous uh, road sprint ability he's got, but he can climb as well on these three climbs, yet ahead of these riders, and, uh, uh, but again, one man on his own. Well, the problem is, um, he's nobody in the front and he's nobody behind, so he can do what he wants, really. But um, as I was saying earlier on, that uh, you have to be, it's no handicap to be a big guy for these, uh, for the likes of these hills. And we see again as well, uh, Ludwig, who is not by no means a small guy, um, he's a powerhouse, and uh, the hills definitely suited him. 
and he's done disaster to this chasing group here because they now seem to have uh, lost interest in who chased him down and a lot of people sitting up so that's to the benefit of Ludwig but I'm sure he could have done with a bit of help to come up there the amazing man here has done very little by the way Ball Ballerini um, at uh, number 31 has been sort of oh, he comes up sits there and, and we never see him really go through to the front no, Ballerini is, is always like that. It, 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 even here now you have the groups going away and Ballerini's not even having it, trying to have a go on. Like he's no teammates in the group with him, he's no nobody in the front. He's just hoping for a free ride free ride to the to, to the finish, but maybe he hasn't got great commission either. And uh, Ekimov uh, showing a good turn of speed. Down the road you can see uh, Ludwig, so we've got the was well, an East German rider being chased down by a Russian. <laughs> Two Russians actually, because Konishev is there as well. So oh, it was Konishev, was it? It was Konishev, yeah. yeah. So um, the Russians are having a party. A little chat amongst themselves. Nobody going to understand what they're saying. This one, Helen by the one that's always looked upon as the as the sort out of the race. There's still another couple of climbs yet to come after this particular one. But Helen by goes up. It's a thousand uh, meters the long climb up, and it only got up to 155 meters high. But nevertheless, it's a long drag, and these two now beginning to feel it. And on the long straight roads, must be coming in sight now. Well, uh, it's, uh, I'm sure it is, but uh, here we are now, we can see it. It's very uh, difficult, yeah. Because you're, the problem with these kinds of hills is you're, you're coming into, you're looking up, you see the top, and you feel like you're just stuck to the road, and you have to get over it. And like, they've, they've been riding big gears for the last 20 odd kilometers or so since the last hill. Now they are coming to this hill here, they must go down onto the small ring, 41, uh, 41, 16, 41, 17. Like you see, actually, 41. Possibly on 19 of our cameraman gives us a very good, very good shot of the... You're counting the, the teeth, aren't you? I can yeah, see you do it. <laughs> count the teeth. I'd say to have, um, as Lise is going away, he's actually putting the power on now. He's looking very, very impressive as Rue is taking a, a bit of a hammering now on the hill. Well, the crowd enthusiastically supporting. And that gap is down. That can't be much more than about 15 seconds now. That little chasing group looked very strong indeed. Uh, that was the one wedge between. Uh, right at the top of the hill is where we saw the, uh, the chasing group after leading two. This is going to be Ludwig on his own at the moment. Being hammered that after was, as well. That was okay. a very interesting group we saw there, Dave. But there wasn't, any, it wasn't, it wasn't one uh, uh, GBS rider in it. Right. So that'd be very interesting to see now what happens now because there's uh, until now we've had a GBS rider in every group. Where this group of four or five, we just sort of got a shot up there. There was no, uh, no GBS rider in it here. And you can see here, Ru is having a hard time. Like, it's very difficult after riding on flat rolls, riding the peak gears, 53, 13, 53, 12, and all of a sudden you hit this wall, your legs just go dead. You're going from 53, 13, 53, 12, and down to a 41, 19, 41, 21. It's like hitting a head off a stone wall. And at this particular point then, where they've actually been racing for, what, some 220-odd uh, kilometres, in fact, coming to 230, so they've had a long day in the saddle, started 10 o'clock this morning in... Uh, in Central European time, and he really has blown a gasket now. And look at this chasing group coming after him. The two Gewiss Balan riders begin to move up toward the front. They, they pull back uh, Rue, so up in front is one rider on his own. So Gewiss Balan, it is Bjorn Rees on his own, but no more than about uh, 10 seconds ahead of this group. Uh, they come up to him now that the French rider has been reeled in, uh, but this man on his own at the moment, down the other side, still two climbs yet to come. Can this be in the last 20 kilometres a lone break to stay away? He's got two teammates in that chasing group. They certainly won't aid the attempt to close him down. But uh, one man now, no match then. Oh, and all Konoshev going up there. It looks like Rook's uh, going across it as well. Yakimov has blown a gasket. Pensek's gone up to him as well. Kasani. As Konoshev is dying. And up there in front, we can see uh, uh, Ludwig as well. Kasani climbing up, but isn't doing it too comfortably. Konoshev plowing around an enormous big gear. And Rook's for Oops. Holland is going up. And Pensek with him. This could be good now because if you look at it again, the the the, the G West riders, there's nobody there. So um, earlier on, the race looked we're all going for a G West. Capucci, Capucci, Musio have gone as well. So earlier on, this race looked to be all set for a G West rider, but now the, they may still win it. But it's um, the groups now are starting to form, and there's less and less G West riders in the front. So this is great. And there's one already actually putting Furlands sat on the front of Chamil and trying to put the cork on this bottle and just roll that up there. Jamil looks back, he's got uh, uh, Bunyo not far behind him, and Armstrong in there as well. Now, if these keep rolling, this is quite a handy little group, isn't it? It is, but uh, it's possibly too far behind. 
Ballerini there as well, so they are quite a competent group, but this is, let me put in the picture, Reese is on his own in front, then we have this little group here, uh, which has in it two Gavis Berlin riders, and... Uh, Lucio, yes, yeah, Gerard Rue, and, and Saligari too, yes. Saligari, yeah. Yeah. So they can still chase, can't they? They can, yeah, and then behind them there's another, there's Ludwig, yep. and behind Ludwig we've got another small group, uh, Yep. With, uh, that's with this one here. Yeah, no, okay, the third that's group. actually further behind because we have yeah. uh, we have um, uh, we have Armstrong in the group, and Armstrong right. was behind. So look at the speed. This like Kip Putty's come up as well, taking up uh, uh, Pansek with him, and looks like one of the GBMG riders. Yet another passenger on his way up. I think it might be Shandri on his way up. So that's another regroupment going on. They are going absolutely flat out, and he's having men for himself at the moment. But this group is possibly the group that was 140 down the leaders, and. Um, Possibly now they're down to a minute. We're looking at, and I think they've got Reese. Reese has just been pulled back, and as they as they catch Reese, Grimish below and go on the attack. As Reese was caught, so Gavis Belan launched an attack to try and get away, and they prize a little bit of daylight, but marked out then by uh, Museo and Saligari, who quickly jumped up. Yet again, Kengi Alta has been going all day long, trying to get away, but he's been marked out again by GBMG. A nice move by Museo. Looks over his shoulder, does Kengi Alta. Can see Museo, who probably isn't going to persist with this one. So now the two-man group originally, they've been away for an awful long time, being pulled back. This is the main front of the field, and something like about a minute behind is another group containing people like Bunyo and Armstrong and Kierpucci, but they're all over the road at the moment, and uh, Gavis Balan doing the right thing, firing off one rider, but somehow, look at this, they're everywhere, aren't they, yeah, this, this is the problem, they've already done 220 yards, 230 kilometers, so <laughs> everybody's very, very, very tired now, it's only the survival of the fittest now at the moment. But you must say, Musio is having a fantastic race at the moment. We saw him getting away a few minutes ago with Shangliadi, and uh, Shangliadi wouldn't ride, and why? Because he knew that if he, he went to the finish with uh, Musio, he'd actually be beaten in the sprint, so he wasn't going to invest too much energy in trying to stay away. He preferred to let the bunch come back to him again, and possibly he would try again later on, because he's tried now, so he would definitely try again. He has the sh just shows he has the legs to, to be attacking. And of course, uh, although it, we're, it split a bit, there were three Gouis Berlin in this one, because they're, they're also they've got two other eyes that came up as well, so in fact, by going back, they've got several cars to play. But it looks like being blasted out, that, that attack then, uh, has made it very difficult. Only six men in this one, including uh, uh, Rooks. Rook, and anyway, we're, we're back. This is the second group. Let's run, uh, face it up. Number one group just down the road. We saw with Mazao. Mazao's group as such. And this is the second place group with Ballerini again playing Tail and Charlie. And uh, Gerard Roux going off the front. Actually, possibly behind. He's actually got a ah, problem, yes. I think. Yes, he is. He's, he's got a mechanical problem, I think. Possibly a puncture. Ah. He has, yeah, a rear puncture. That's bad for Rui because he's having a, a good day so far. Uh, but yes, so that's stupid. Oh, it's gone car. straight past him. Yeah, he pulled into the right hand side of the road, but normally he should have been waiting. But this is bad now. Lucky. Yeah, this is uh, normally he must stop on the right hand side of the road. If the car stops behind him, puts the wheel in, and away he goes. Now, when he gets back on his bike, the car's going to obstruct him. If you see here, he goes, the car is there, and he's. No, it's not a uh, bad. Um, <laughs> I thought they, they took the, the pin in, as it was on a bend, they could drop off on the bend and he would come across the corner of the bend to them. But uh, well, Possibly yeah. they only saw him the last minute, possibly. Ah, yes. Because yeah. uh, sometimes the cars are far behind and you, as they're amongst other cars, it's difficult to see. A tractor on the side of the road got itself marooned. I'm surprised they didn't ask him to back up a little bit, but There's he hasn't got the trouble. Yes, further attacks. Having a go again. And yeah. Lucio is once again there on the wheel. Like, Lucio is having an incredible day today. I, I keep repeating myself, but... Um, Fair play to him, he's there all the time. Every time somebody attacks, he's, he's marking and he's there. So the climb of Saint Pierre, as we're now in the final kilometers of this race, and Konishev, another big fellow who just scrambled up the top of that climb, hanging on for grim death, but now he's got back in this little group. Uh, the other yellow jersey you can see down the road there, that's Rooks for TVM, there he is. And the other yellow jersey is that of Bunyo, who's been looking remarkably calm all day. And this man here, Kasani, won't chase it down, he's got his teammate up in front. So still, I don't know, it's not over yet, is it? For, um, it's not over thing? yet, but we, it's unfo unfortunate we have not got time checked for this group, but um, we don't know how far they are down on the, on the, on the first or the second group. Uh, so, um, but if they keep riding the way they're going, definitely as the previous riders getting dropped. Uh, yep. We don't know where we are now, it's the second <laughs> group, I think. It is, because that, you saw the attack of those two men go down the road, and here they are now. And again, uh, see the old baton going up to stop all the vehicles coming through. But Mosea's done Lucio exactly the same thing. Yep, the yep, same, yep. same man on his, on his baggage on his back again. Uh, 
and he definitely won't ride because he knows if he goes to the finish, Musio will beat him in the sprint. So it's uh, unfortunate, unfortunate again for Musio, but it's the penalty he must pay for being a, a sprinter. Yeah. But um, definitely, G Wiss are marking this race so hard today. It's making it impossible for anybody else to get away. They will only get away, they will only go away with riders they feel they can beat. Unfortunate for Musio, he's possibly one of the strongest riders in the race today, and he's being marked out by G Wiss because they know he'll beat him in the sprint. So, Ken Yalta doing another good uh, workmanlike job of sitting on this one and waiting for the rest to come up from behind. The uh, clock, the last time I put a clock on it was uh, about some five seconds back to this one, but we still haven't quite caught up with the with the chasing group either. And Baronk and Saligali isn't going to aid that one, is he? Again, no, yeah, no, yeah. Nor is um, the next Gavis going to do anything either about that either. So, yeah. this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if looks could kill. Well, that little regroup over. Rue seems to be back anyway. That's, yep. that's one good thing. He's back in that group, so it's... Uh, and he's got Rue with him as well. So two Frenchmen might be able to get, have a get stuck in here. Well, two Frenchmen, but they're riding for two different teams. So, unfortunately, the, 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 the nation marked on your passport doesn't mean anything when you're, when you're in bike racing. This group seems to have be a little bit kind of... Uh, settled for second place now because they don't seem to be too en enthusiastic about... About, about riding. Um, Museo actually has got his passenger here at the moment, stage victory in the Tour de France as well, King Yalka, so he's he, no, no slouch, this fellow that performs most of the time as a bit of a domestique, but right now that's the chasing group after them. Again, Baronk doing most of the work on the front, and I think, in fact, you've got th three Frenchmen then, haven't you now, with Baronk, uh, Rue and uh, Rue a. We have, yeah, it's the first time in a long, long time we have so many French riders in the front, but Unfortunately, they're not riding for the same team, so it means that they cannot really, they cannot combine, combine with each other. But um, if they were in the same team, they could ride after the front group, but like I said, unfortunately, they're, they're not. But um, we're not too far away now from the next hill, so it'll be very interesting to see what's going to happen, because uh, uh, if, if, uh, if um, Lucio goes to the finish with uh, Shanghietti, uh, normally he could win, but Sanglietti knows that if he, go, if he goes to the finish with Lucio, he'd be second, so he will prefer that somebody from the, from the, some of his teammates from the second group got across to him. So it sounds still awfully complicated, the team tactic is going on here, and this little bunch here desperately hoping that uh, the hammer will fall on the, the group up in front and all die a thousand deaths, and they'll be in at the shout, but it's a very substantial size of... Uh, of riders here to think they can get through the finish altogether, but nevertheless, uh, good to see that that puncture for Vanesto that Jarru managed to get himself up to that little chasing group. And there are our two leaders. It looks like they're coming back uh, and could well be caught by three men coming from behind. Hang on, those is the chasers. Let's wait and look very carefully. Now, in fact, it is uh, Jarru on the front, isn't it? And uh, Baronk. So these are our chasing group looking after the. the f oh! Puncture for Armstrong. Actually, fell off. He fell off, yep. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see these cobblestones here, a very slight cobblestone that's very slightly wet. So, um, very dangerous situation, of course, when you're getting uh, coming around these corners off good roads onto this kind of cobbles. It makes the road very, very slippy. Uh, but uh, fortunately for Armstrong, he seems to have had no... didn't actually hurt himself. Just twisted the brake levers a little bit, and but he's OK. He's not a mark on his body, so... And the bike seems to be OK, so he's no mechanical trouble. So, um, as you can see, I'm checking it out himself, and just making sure that everything's OK. He buckled back wheel, he buckled his back wheel, so he's letting off, he's putting his hand down to the back brake. He's actually um, uh, letting off the quick release on the brake so that uh, the, um, the wheel is not rubbing the brake blocks anymore. But it doesn't make it an efficient device, does it then? It'll it, still work. It doesn't, but he's, yeah. he's going very well because you see how comfortable he is, he's not panicking at all about getting back to the groove. He fell off and got back on as if he's kind of just stopping for a, <laughs> for a break. And no, no trouble whatsoever getting back on, so he... He's in very, very good form today. Possibly regretting a little bit that he hasn't, uh, wasn't in the front group because um, possibly because he's lacking teammates because he had to do all the work himself. And good to see him riding like that, though, wearing the World Championship jersey because uh, a lot of world champions in the year after it, they, they struggle a bit for one reason or another, but he's this year certainly having a spirited go and riding quite tactically for a young rider because having only come into the pro scene some 18 months ago, he now really has come back uh, in understanding the tactics very well. It is beautiful scene, a beautiful, lovely colour here at this part of the, the world, and the riders then heading in. They've been zigzagging in and out of Belgium, by the way, as well as going out of Holland, this little southeast corner. And at the moment, Mosea, I think, would like some help, but he's not going to get it, is he? 
No, Lucio is uh, unfortunately, fortunately for Lucio at the moment, Shangletti is going through with him, but I'm sure he's not giving it 100% because he knows that he has to keep a little bit for the, um, for the final. But um, if he is riding, he, he must feel himself he has a slight chance of maybe getting away on the final hill. So it'll be very interesting now when we do hit the, the, the second last and the final and the last hill. It'll be interesting to see how he, how, he, how he goes. If he tries to attack, if he's happy to wait for the finish or if he feels the group is going to come back from behind. And the chasing group here of some five men left still. And yep, so Veronk and Jard Rui doing a lot of the work on the front. The two riders immediately behind him aren't going to do anything because they've got teammates away. And young Rue, who got blasted out on the, the climb, hanging on for grim death at the moment, perhaps just waiting and hoping he can get some more life back into his legs. As the commissaire asking the motorcycle to get on and get out of it. And uh, 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 back he comes. This is another of the Gewiss Ballad riders, surely. Is that Reese that's got back again? Volpe. Volpe, is it? Right. There's Reese in there, isn't there? And it's actually uh, Ribberlin, David Ribberlin. Wow. Actually, number four, yeah. No. Volpe is there, certainly, isn't it's it? Volpe and Reese, actually. It's Volpe and Reese are there. Yeah, yep, yeah. that's right. It's Volpe and Reese. And Armstrong working his way through his little lots. Shamashev still at the back, then Rooks, then uh, Kasani, uh, Chamil. Yeah, yeah. Furlong, Ludwig, uh, Bunyo. They're certainly clocking on a bit, aren't they? Yeah, they're, like, the race is by no means over yet. There's, yeah. still, um, there's still a lot of power left in this group. Kapuchi is here also. But the little gaps are opening up, and uh, Yakimov. Fancek, Yakimov. Yeah. But Yakimov yeah. was going well now, but he got dropped earlier on. So yeah. uh, Well, this is his sort of trade, he's on the flat. It is, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 And Fancek too, riding well. But uh, They're having a go, but they're a little bit late for the boat. Yeah. But um, as I was saying earlier on, the, the, the group is still not very, very far behind. So on one of these short hills towards the end, if a Bunyo was very strong with a Ludwig, for example, they could possibly bridge the gap. Well, there we are then. There we have... Uh, Two men in the lead at the moment, Bazao and uh, Peggy Alto. Here they are, these two leading uh, with the gap, probably only about 30 seconds, just some um, eight kilometers to go. This is nothing, just five miles to the finish as such. And uh, virtually the gaps on the road are visible on this long straight stretch here. And uh, can they stay away? Just one small climb yet to come. Inside the final eight kilometres, uh, uh, Petit Lane heading in towards uh, Maastricht at six kilometres to go, and then the Arriva after 250 kilometres of racing in this, the Amstel goal. The fifth of the uh, World Cup Classics this year. We're going to have a short break in the World Cup before we go on to the Tour of uh, Spain, Tour of Italy, and the Tour de France, and come back uh, to the San Sebastian on the uh, 6th of, uh, of August. So the uh, little group here, on the road in the classics for the last time before we have the break in uh, 25 seconds now dave 25 it's coming down so yeah. the, this um uh Musio being in the front is, is, is not uh, it's not over yet this group behind with uh behind Karu, uh Rue, uh, if they keep riding together they could possibly be in there for a win at the end so the two leaders hanging on then so the gap then some 30 seconds for these riders and that's they are visible down the road these long straight stretches uh, but still they're not going to be see the two give us riders at the back here not going to also give us and GB not going to aid the chase at all and there's some tired legs there as far as room race so but the, the speed the high speed see all those cars behind the leading this uh, chasing group now that still shows that there's got to be in excess of half a minute between this group and the group behind so the main bunch here we are 22 seconds of this one behind that there's got to be another half minute to 40 seconds to the group containing Bunyo and Ekimov and the rest of them including Chamil leader in the World Cup in this the fifth round of the series before we come back for the uh, San Sebastian Classic in August that'll be followed after that uh, by the Leeds International the Championship of Zurich the Paris Tour and the Tour of Lombardy so the riders here having their last chance to score points in the World Cup all get those names up on the first second and third in a classic and here we are these two leaders Rolling along to a reasonable rate, up at 20 odd seconds, surely, uh, Stephen. That's not. Uh, is that enough? It's not enough, really, but it depends on what's happening behind. Uh, apparently, for the moment, uh, the group behind them is only riding as fast as these. Uh, 
So it's only when the group behind you is organised and they're riding hell for leather after you that it's, um, it's, very, it's, it's difficult to keep a small gap. But at the moment, as you saw a few minutes ago, the, the, um, the second group is finding it difficult in getting themselves organised. There's like Rue and Pan and, uh, and um, Verank are the only ones that are riding. So it's, uh, it's difficult for them to come back. As you see here, this is a very, very difficult point because you're coming off the big road that's been riding the big gears, possibly with a cross tailwind. And all of a sudden you go from 3, 12 down to 41, 17, 18, 19 maybe. So um, when you have 240 kilometers in your legs, it makes it very difficult. And Kegels are putting the pressure on the front, now rolling away. And Mosea looking back. Certainly Mosea would, I think, like to stay with his one man and try and screw him in the sprint rather than have the rest of that uh, group come up from behind. But Kegels not done very much in here. It's no more than about 20 seconds. That uh, little group still coming up at them. But the danger lies in the group containing Bunyo even further back. So there we are. That's uh, six kilometers from the finish. It's still very much a cliffhanger, and they can't afford the two leaders. In fact, well, there's only one leader, really, isn't there? I suppose Mose is the only one we've got to think about. Uh, to, to relax for one moment, can they? No, they, they cannot relax, and the, the one thing about it is when you get over this hill, you drop straight down to the finish. So it means the gap that you have on top, if they keep riding, they will hold the gap. But um, the problem is uh, each of them know that... Um, each of them know that uh, Mucio is very strong, so... Um, is Shang Letty going to keep continue, continue riding? Well, we'll have to wait and see if they close that gap down, getting within six kilometres to the finish. The chasers uh, in the third group now have still got something like a minute separating them from these two. A very good move by Museo to go away, immediately marked by Kengel. This little narrow climb, the, the final one of the day, 28 climbs in all, and... Uh, the attack. Yep, Kengel trying to go yeah. amazing. He's, he's very sure of himself. He's very, very sure of himself. And today, to, to attack Museo, even from the front, he, should have, he could have even gone behind Museo and attacked him from behind, but he didn't. But he did not take so it he's very, very finish. sure. No, he, he knows did. that yeah. this, is, this is a problem now, because Shang Letty knows that if he goes to the finish with Museo, there's a good chance of him being beaten. So he will say, well, OK, if I, if I go to the finish and be beaten, I'm going to get told off tonight. So if I ease up and maybe they come back on, maybe Reese or maybe one of his other teammates can, can, can have a, give him a chance of winning. Because nobody wants to be second in a, in, a, in a classic, especially when you have the strongest team in the race. There speaks a man, Stephen Roche, if you just tuned in to Eurosport's coverage of the Amstel Gold, who was second in 1982, so he knows what it's like. And it's Claudio Chiapucci, his old teammate here, who's at the front then for Carrera, really stretching the feet. And that shows you how close they are to Chaser. This whole thing is getting like they could almost come back together. The power then of Chiapucci rocketing up this hill at the moment. And right behind him, as ever present, we get the GBMG mark. And off they go over the top. Gavispalan again marking as well. So, in fact, uh, Kirpuchi's gone across the room. Yes. Now he's, he's yes. gone straight across that second group. Kirpuchi has unleashed and taken with him Rooks as well at the back here now. Only 35 seconds. That's going to put some real fire into that chase, surely. Definitely it will. But um, once again, the race is not over for the guys in the front because they, uh, who's, going to, who, who's capable of winning? The two of them are capable of winning and no one's sure to win. So I remember the same situation back in the years, in the age, back in 87, whereas... I had the same situation with Cricket Lona. I didn't feel I was capable of winning. Cricket didn't feel he was capable of winning, so he wanted to do as little, little work as possible. And in the end, in the final 500 metres, Argentina came from behind and beat us. So How did you go your second place here, though, Stephen, when you were second in, in 82? Was that with a bunch? Or? We had, uh, there was, um, we, we caught the, 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 the guys in the front, we caught them about five kilometres to go, and uh, there was a group of about 15 of us, and Jan Ras attacked with a kilometre to go. As we all know, Jan Ras was a very, very good last kilometre rider. And uh, I left it two seconds late, too late to go after him. He had uh, 20 yards on me, and the finish he beat me by about two yards. Ah. So, um, unfortunately, <laughs> but it happens, you know. But uh, the boys are now going to roll down uh, to the finish. And um, like Sangietti now is going to say, well, OK, if I want to win this classic, I've got to sit in his wheel and try and come off his wheel in the sprint. But um, this could give the boys behind them a chance to, to come back on again because they seem very determined, as we can see here in the... In, our, in, the, in, the, in the screen, uh, they're very determined to come back. But if you see it again, Capucci doing all the riding here. Like the other day in the edge, we saw him doing all the riding, but he seems to be coming to the front only with six, seven kilometers to the finish. And unfortunately, he has very, very good legs, but he only comes around for the, for the final. But he's a not case on the descents, isn't he? I mean, he can really go here. And they're very small roads as well. You can see here from our, from our camera, it's very, very small roads down to the finish. So it's, um, 
a very good opportunity for him to come down as as uh, Muzio asks uh, very politely his friend and uh, and partner in this, this breakaway in the Amsterdam goal race to, to give him a help, give him a hand out. There can't be more than about 20 seconds in this now because we've, we've been down this hill on the cameras and that right turn is just where the woods are in the distance there. We've just gone into that one as well, so no more than about 20 seconds in this one. And the man is doing nothing to aid the chase, rather surprised. He rooks at the back here. I mean, he's been hanging on all day and he's got back up there again, but they're letting Kipuchi do all the work uh, and yet rooks has ridden comfortably, but surely he must get and try and help this one through. Or is he going to be happy with third place? Well, Rooks is the kind of a guy that rider that never does very much in, in groups. He will always make the most of it. the riding. The other riders, other riders are going to do as they come to the kilometer flag. Yep. Kilometer flag. They're in front, but that doesn't mean that they, they've won because uh, <laughs> um, there's no cooperation at all from one rider to the other. Musio is definitely the fastest sprinter, but he, how tired is he? He's done uh, so much riding over the, over all day. He's been in every most group has gone away, but he's been in the, he's been in them all. Uh, so he knows he's going to be tired. And how strong is Shangli uh, now going to be? The gap on my clock then is only 15 seconds as they went under that kilometre sign. Now that could be enough within the normal just riding out, but at the moment they might have done enough to stay out there. The crowd then watching these two, and they're concerned as well. Museo is. He's got uh, Kengi Alt on his wheel, and they. They're going to come sweeping round that bend just behind him any moment now. And I tell you, there they are. Come, come. And they've got to watch out for this one. As on the front, then, Museo doesn't want to lead out Kengi Alta, but the others lot are chasing him down. And in this lot, as Rook starts to wind it up and go as well. So the gap was 15 seconds, but uh, really, that is probably just enough, I suppose. It's crazy. Capucci's doing all the work itself. The lads see the two riders in front of them, and still nobody wants to help Capucci. This is crazy. This is incredible. Nobody wants to ride. It's. Um, I think it was the Grand Prix of Timbuktu, but it's, it's the Amstel Gold Race, and nobody wants to ride. Well, there with great feelings, speaks a man who finished second in this race, Stephen Roche. At the moment, it looks like they're going to be fighting out for third place as uh, Kengi Alta on the right hand side begins to accelerate. Up in front of Museo has just about got him next. Uh, has he though? Kengi Alta coming at him, and they're almost elbows. Lucky the lucky, still Museo's in front. Museo's got just the edge, but has he gone too soon? Museo, the great Roman sprinter, throws his bike to line, oh. and yes. he's just about got it. Kengi Alta switched, hoping to fall him, finishing second place and sprinting into third then. Uh, that is Sally another... Gary. Yeah, Sally Gary, another of the GBMG riders across the line. And uh, Museo, uh, look, he's got to be absolutely over the world with that one. Second in the Tour of Flanders, just by about uh, a couple of inches, and now he's got this one, and you can sense it too from GMG. They played a wonderful game. They beat Gibbis Bellan, who put so many riders in that uh, early breaks. And here we go then with this little group that, that uh, was been all day long chasing. Chamil coming up there on the right-hand side of the screen, wearing the jersey of the uh, World Cup leader. Looks like he's going to get himself enough points then to carry himself through. I'm looking at Museo's uh, score in the World Cup so far. He had, in fact, got 40 this morning, so 50 more give him 90 points. But Chamil, with 91, has got himself there, placed probably about 7th about, uh, or 8th. So it looks like Chamil could keep that jersey. What well, a scrum. Definitely Chamil will keep it, but um, if anybody deserves to win today, it's definitely Museo because he's in every group. In every break that went away, he was in it and always participating, always riding. And also, like you can see how strong he is. Look at uh, Shangletti, the gear he's on. Um, Musio is definitely on the 12th here, and Shangletti possibly on the, tre on the 13. Uh, so definitely, <laughs> he was so strong in the end. It's incredible. It's fair play to him. Yeah, here we are, side view then, as he throws his arms up. You see, we've seen this before, and at each switch to come through the other side, actually got a good bike length away from him, but uh, that's something so many riders do, and so often it can nearly uh, end in disaster. But uh, Museo now, with the press round about him, I'm sure his father was also a great rider too. In fact, his father was a turn pro, but didn't earn the sue in the first four months and went back and opened up a garage to, uh, uh, to earn some money. And so... That was uh, Museo has still been brought on by his father, and he must be very pleased with that success. And of course, Museo last year in the Tour de France stage victor took on the yellow jersey, short period sprinter, extraordinaire for the green jersey too. And this is how he shows that superb ability. He's quite a reasonable climber and a first-class sprinter. And now to his list of successes goes a win in the Amstel Gold. He knows this race very well indeed. He's had a second place in 1992, and now he's got a first place. So our congratulations go out to the GBMG rider Johan Mazzeo for a superb sprint finish which carried him to victory in this the uh, 29th version of the Amstel Gold.
The crowd at the finish then waiting for the presentation of the victors' laurels and the jerseys. And according to my quick calculation, I think probably that Shamil has kept the uh, jersey as the leader on the World Cup. And we see down there an enormous inflatable uh, Amstel gold beer. I could do the drop that myself. My sore throat's come back that now it's getting somewhat better. But here, uh, Telecom rolling on in. Uh, must have been pleased with the way that uh, Ludwig, who used to live uh, not far from here at Balkenberg, was performing today. But he wasn't in with a shout, having been a winner in uh, previous years. And they're having their own little sprint at the back end of this one because prize is usually go down to about uh, 30th place. And there's always a few bob to be earned as far as your team is concern but the elation then with GBMG and uh, our congratulations go out then to fine bit of riding and I think you agree with that one there he is uh, up there for GBMG in fact that's the Italians going full chat at the moment our Italian coming up you know this fellow he's been around for a long time the Italian uh, announced hasn't he the Senor Danzana he's been he worked with Rai, Rai Uno Rai Wana. Yeah. he's been around uh, a long long time and one thing when you're talking to him when you're talking to him, he's never looks. He's never looks. For, don't know how he can even listen to you when you're talking to you because he never looks at your face when you're talking. Kind of, he kind of, he follows the conversation, but um, sometimes we ask him how it is. Well, the rest rolling on in now. Some tired legs here, and of course some rest, relaxation, massage uh, before the riders. Then some of these riders heading off down to the. The Tour of Spain was the next big one on the, uh, on the list as far as they're concerned and we'll be covering uh, that, as I said earlier on, on the weekend, Saturdays and Sundays and extended news programme as well on Eurosport of the Tour of Spain so you can tune into your dish each night when you get home to find that's happening in that the first of the, uh, the big tours of the year. Uh, the riders then, Stephen, when you come through this classic uh, part of the season, just how you feel with the, with the tours coming up? Well, this, this is um, one part of the season over now. Some of the riders now have calculated everything on the Paris-Roubaix, Flèche-Wallon, lies bastogne Amsterdam Gold Race, the likes of Musio. Musio now will probably have a rest now because he will not be going to a tour of Spain. So he'll have a rest now and prepare himself now for a possible uh, win in the national championships which are in July before going to the Tour de France. And then hopefully try to win a stage in the Tour de France. But now we get a second type of rider who will come to the fore now we see likes of roaming here in Duran, Delgado, uh, stage riders. We see these kind of riders now coming to the fore for the stage races. But you were a great stage rider, but you also used to have a crack in all these classics as well. It, it, isn't sure that that's the most tiring thing to do? It is. Rominger had a good go in Liege Bastogne Liege as well. Like I kind of prepared for Liege Bastogne Liege by riding the likes of Flesh Wellon and uh, and uh, other other classics. Whereas these riders now are, the, are all the very same. They they some classics the likes of uh, Musio will be preparing directly for Tour de Flanders and the Amstel. Whereas Liege Bastogne Liege wouldn't really be his race. The likes of Chimie will be preparing for Liège Bastogne Liège and Paris Roubaix. He won Paris Roubaix and he had a very good ride in Liège Bastogne Liège. Every rider knows his, his, um, what he's capable of doing and prepares for the race which, which suits him. Well, this man prepared for this one and Jan Mazzea lifting high that trophy as victor of the Amsterdam Gold. It's the 29th uh, race in the series and uh, a very happy man indeed. And I think if he'd been beaten in the sprint, he'd have chucked himself in the canal just down the road there because uh, he having lost out in the Tour of Flanders, the one he definitely wanted to win, and now he is there up on the rostrum. And undoubtedly the Gewicht Balan this time, who uh, had so many men all day long controlling the brakes, just didn't manage to pull it off this time round. But they've had a successful start the season too as well. This is Shang Yeti, you see how, how tall he is. We were going, talking earlier on about being tall riders. He's, uh, he's, he's also a very tall rider and a very good classic rider. You can see Musio now, it's very important to note how fresh he looks now at the end of the race. He, in every break, he's on 260 odd kilometers, 28 hills, and look how, look how fresh he is. Like he's, he's um, the sign that he's been really, really, really tying himself 100% to go well in this race today. It's always the same with the victory. I remember you know, when you watch the, uh, the Oxford and Cambridge boat race, for instance, the winners always look elated, and the chaps who come in second are absolutely exhausted. It doesn't matter which way you watch it, it's always the same. There's something that sort of lifts you up, I suppose. Isn't there? Well, as opposed to the lads that win, have a, have, a, have a bouquet of flowers and a nice mademoiselle to give them the flowers, so they have to put on a smile. <laughs> no, uh, Victor, you are mosaic, very pleased with that one, and uh, we look forward to him being in the uh, 
in the Tour de France. We're going to cover that one on Eurosport as well, and I say the Vuelta as well, which he won't be riding, but uh, Romiger, the man, the hot tip for the front. So they're all climbing back up here to, to be interviewed again. And of course, our, our Belgian uh, are now getting in the act as well. We shall have the presentations, uh, we hope, of the World Cup uh, jersey to Chamil, who, that's quite amazing. The man who was the World Cup uh, leader last year, Fondres, out with the uh, problem with the slip disc. But for Chamil to go into the, uh, the tours coming, then there's that uh, World Cup lead must really lift him at this stage, then, Stephen. Well, it means at least he'll have the, this World Cup jersey now guaranteed now at last for the Tour de France. So it's, uh, I'm sure, like, when everybody talks now about the World Cup, they will say, well, Chamil is the leader. So it means, like, if he had lost it this week, it would have meant that, well, he, no one talks about him anymore now until September. So at least now, right through the whole summer, when every...